couple weeks ago, uh, Alan asked me to preach. I'm not a preacher uh, by any means. I enjoy doing it, but it's just draining. It was good to hear that uh, Alan and Sherry are having such a good time because standing behind this pulpit just week after week is just is just draining and it's it's only by the grace of God that people are, can do it and I hope they're having a good time. Well, I'm going to be reading in uh, first in Joshua 24th chapter verses. Verses 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sin, sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in, Egy in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is, is, is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, whose land you are living. But for as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that generation that followed, um, followed Joshua served the Lord. But as soon as he died, things started going bad. And the second chapter of Judges, it, it, it describes that era. Uh, starting in verse 6, it says, When Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each into his inheritance to, inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived, or sur <coughs> survived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnah Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. And all the generations also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet work the work which he had done for Israel. And the sons of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord and served the Baals. And later on it says, and the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of the plunderers, and the plunder, who plundered them and sold them into the hands of enemies around them, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Then later on it says, Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. That's a cycle uh, of a vicious cycle that uh, went on for 410 years in Israel. Eight times in the book of Judges it said that they uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord turned them over into bondage. Uh, when I was preparing this message, uh, sermon preparation for me is extremely difficult. It's I'm not a preacher, I wasn't trained that way. My field of study was classical studies in college, and that's what my degree is in, Greek and Latin. But uh, I have a, a lot of commentaries at home, so I always go to, to the commentaries. One of the commentaries, there's a, a man named R.B. Riddle, and he outlines a, a four-point sermon he calls God's Final Word. The first point is, there is no salvation without a personal knowledge of God. Those people that came after, that generation that came after Joshua, had forgotten all that uh, God had done for, for Israel. They had forgotten the fact that when they came in and went up against Jericho, God literally knocked down the walls so they could get in. You can't explain that scientifically. Think so, yeah, maybe it was an earthquake. But they were knocked down flat. So, but there's a greater miracle that was done in Joshua's time. It said the the earth, the sun stood still in the sky. Well, how do you explain that scientifically? You can't. The, the sun stood still for an entire day in the sky. 
We say, well, that's not physically possible. The God that created the sun and the earth and the universe can do with, with it whatever he wants to do. Yeah, I believe it happened. It says it was never done before and never done since. But the people of that generation, or the following generation, forgot that. And so they, they were led into bondage. Second point, men tend to forget and forsake God. They not only, that generation not only uh, forgot God, they started worshiping other gods, Baal and Ashtaroth. And that, that uh, uh, idol worship lasted not only through the time of the judgment, but clear on into, through the kingdom era. And it, it was never finally ridden until they went into to bondage and, and uh, Babylonia. God will not let us backslide comfortably. When, uh, when they, the children of Israel went into bondage, it, it was pretty bad place to be. The, the people that were in, over them hated them. They had come into their country and they were sent there by God to wipe them out, which they didn't do. So, the final word. Its final word is forgiveness and mercy to those who repent. The four points don't don't uh, give the root cause of why that cycle existed. What was causing the people to uh, turn away from God, to forget God and forsake Him? Author G. H. Livingston writes: The sin of Adam and Eve did not bring disaster into their lives alone. It continued on from son to son, from age to age. That sin nature that comes into man, you can't explain it medically, physically. Is it part of our DNA? Who knows? You know, it's just, it's there, it's a, it's a, it's a, a reality. Other uh, countries have, and other uh, religions have tr tried to explain that away. And that brings me to a, uh, something that happened to me, something I remember from college, and the uh, uh, way the Greeks tried to explain it away. Well, I'd taken a class in Greek history uh, in the very first semester I was there at the University of Idaho. I took a, a history course. But uh, later on, I needed credits at the master's level, at a 500 level. So I, you could retake a class if it was at a higher level, and it actually was a different uh, fellow that, that taught the class. And one of these days I'm going to write a book about all the different <laughs> events that happened in my life. And I'm going I'm to have a chapter, and I'm going to call it Uncle Louie and Adam's Legacy. Now, who's Uncle Louie? Uncle Louie was Louis Perot. He was a, a professor of classics at the University of Idaho. There were three classics professors. You can imagine in a, in a university that size, there would be more in every field of study, but there was three. There's Dr. Perot, Dr. Lushnig, who was the Greek professor, and Dr. Rowe, who was the dean of college and letters of the science at the time, so he didn't uh, didn't teach much until later on. But uh, Dr. Perot, Louis, was teaching a, the Greek class that I'd enrolled in. Well, I he 
taught Greek from the literary and, and architectural and standpoint, you know, talking about the literature and the architecture and, and all of the age, where Dr. Coonrod before taught more from a military standpoint. But, uh, uh, Louis was a character. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. He had uh, done his master's work for three years at the Pontifical Gregorian Institute in the Vatican in Rome. First year he was there, they spoke nothing but Latin. So he's pretty well versed in, in Latin. He was my Latin professor. And later on he was my thesis advisor. But I'm sitting there in the class listening to Louis. And uh, he had a habit of sitting on a desk, or not a desk, a table out in front of the room, cross-legged, and he'd, he'd be teaching the class, and he'd get on rabbit trails someplace, and he'd tell little stories of what happened to him at, at the Vatican, and talking about his niece and nephew, he called them Brat and Bratina, and he'd get on these little, little stories. Well, I was sitting there, and it was right at lunchtime, the class was from 11 to 12. And it was in the admin building, which just about uh, 50 yards away was the satellite sub. And they had a uh, restaurant there, a little cafe. And uh, they made German sausage sandwiches, and they were good. And you could actually smell those sausages being cooked. And I'm hungry. My stomach's growling there. And I was thinking, oh. Sure, like to have one. And Louis asked me a question. And like before, when the older lady had said something, everything just went poof, right out of my mind. He said, What is the main element in Greek tragedy? Well, he figured that I knew what the question was because I'd spent four years translating Greek tragedy. <laughs> and, uh, but I forgot. I totally forgot. So I mumbled along there for about two, three minutes. Finally, he asked me again, and I said, well, it's got to be tragic. Made him mad. <laughs> but later on, after the class, I explained to him what had happened. He laughed. He said, yeah, they're, they, they're really good. I have them. I eat them, too. So he didn't. But the point he was making that uh, the main element in Greek tragedy is the protagonist or the, the hero of a Greek tragedy has a, a fatal flaw in their character that leads them to their own destruction. So that fatal flaw is original sin. It comes into to, uh, Christian theology. It's been called many different things, but, but it's the sin nature that we inherited from, from Adam and Eve, and it continues. We'd like to think that uh, with the advent of Christianity and outpouring the Spirit uh, on the world, that, that that cycle's been broken. It has not. It continues to this day. It just... I wrote down three different time periods and studied three different time periods in... in, in uh, the 1500s and the, and the Wesley era and uh, in the era in Germany from 1933 to 1945. That first era, um, the church had gotten so corrupt that that they didn't even, they didn't preach the message whatsoever anymore. And a man named they called Pope. Uh, Leo X had uh, became Pope after the, fall, the earlier Pope had died. Well, he was waging war against the Turks, so he needed the money, so he sent people out to the, all the countries that were Catholic countries with pardons, and they called indulgences. So uh, he sent a man to Germany a guy named Tetzel, to sell these indulgences. 
what an indulgence was. If you knew you were going to sin, you could pay for it ahead of time. You could give the, the give this friar money to absolve you of the sin. Well, Martin Luther was a pastor in Wittenberg and was had been opposed to the church and its practices for many years. And in 1516, he attacked a, a document on the door of the church in Wittenberg called the 95 Thesis. And that's what started the Protestant Revolution, or Reformation. And then uh, again, in uh, the 1700s, the world had went, or Europe anyway, had went back into that cycle of, of fleeing from God, away from God. And I've got some uh, quotes from that time. I wrote here, by the early 1700s, England and most of Europe had be again strayed away from God. I've uh, been reading a bunch of books by a guy named Eric Metaxas, and if you get a chance to read some of these books, they're they're really really good. But in his book, Amazing Grace, they actually made a movie about called Amazing Grace. It was actually taken from that book by Metaxas. That that was the script for the movie. But he writes in that. He said, it's entirely interesting to most of us, life in 18th century Britain was particularly brutal, decadent, violent, and vulgar. And then later he writes, it's hard to avoid the harsh conclusion that the Church of England at that time was little more than a pseudo-Christian purveyor of government-sponsored institutionalized hypocrisy. That's how bad it had become. At the same time in, in France, uh, the problems were the same in France and England that led up to the, the French Revolution. From 1889 to 1899, the France was just in turmoil. They call it the, uh, the reign of terror. In England, the same problems were happening. And if it hadn't been for the Wesley and the revivals, they would have done the same thing. Here's a quote, another quote, and this is from a, a guy named Lord Melbourne, who was a member of the British Parliament. Things have come to a pretty pass when one should permit one's religion to invade public life. He's saying that religion has no, uh, no place in public life or the government. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? But he was saying this in opposition to William Wilberforce, who was trying to uh, abolish the slave trade that was just one of the worst things that happened, one of the most corrupt things. He fought for 20 years in Parliament. He was a member of Parliament to abolish the slave trade. And finally, just shortly before his death, they abolished slavery. And later on, they, they actually er, abolished the slave trade. But later on, 188 days or years ago to this day in England, abolished slavery in England, a year after he died. Uh, on July 31st, 18, or 1784, they abolished slavery. Okay, that third time period is, uh, is 1933 to 1945 in Germany. When I was in my senior year of college, I took a class. Uh, it was called German Culture and Institutions. It was uh, it was covered the time period between the unification of the tribes in Germany under Bismarck until the end of the Second World War in 1945. And we read a, a lot of 
I saw a lot of movies about that time period, the Nazi area in, in Germany. And uh, I had a professor, college professor there from Germany. His name was Gerd Steckel. He was born and raised in Germany. And he came to the United States to work on his uh, doctoral degree at the University of Min in Minnesota. And he told me, he said, that time period from 1933 to 1945 is completely gone in their history books. Nobody, nobody talked anything about that. And it wasn't until he got to Minnesota that he realized what went on during that time period. So what went on during that time period? The, uh, it always ama amazed me that, that uh, the church in Germany would allow Hitler to do what he did, he killed six million Jewish people. Where was the German church in that time, so-called Christian church? And why did they let him do what he did? Metaxas again, the writer says, Germans believed Hitler was basically one of them. And, uh, and they welcomed the Nazis' plan to reorganize society, including the church. Here's a quote from, from Hitler himself. It says, it's been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regard sacrifice for their fatherland as the highest goal? The Mohammedan, Mohammedan religion too would have been more combat, compatible to us than Christianity. I missed the page. <laughs> Why did it have to be Christianity with its weakness and flabby, flabbiness? That was written by Hitler. Okay. What then was Hitler's plan for the German church? He assigned a man named Albert Rosberg, Rosenberg to develop a 31-point plan for the reorganization of the church. And here's just a few of those plans. Okay, number 13, the National Church demands cessa cessation of the publishing and dissemination of the Bible in Germany. No, no more writing of the Bible in Germany. The National Church declares that it, and therefore to the German nation, it has been decided that the Führer's Mein Kampf is the greatest of all documents. It not only contains the greatest but it embodies the purest and truest ethics, ethics for the present and future life of our nation. Mind comp, mind struggle. If anybody's ever read that, it's spooky. Number 18, the National Church will clear away from its altars all crucifixes, Bibles, and pictures of saints. On the altars of the, on the altars there must be nothing but Mein Kampf to the German nation and therefore to God the most sacred book. And the last one, on the day of its foundation, the Christian cross must be removed from all churches, cathedrals, chapels, and it must be superseded by the only unconquerable symbol, the swastika. That was what's happening. In, in Germany at the time. Were they, was there anybody that uh, opposed them? Yeah, there was a group, a group of, of theologian pastors that uh, started their own church. They called the Confessing Church, and Diedrich Bonhoeffer was, was one of them, and my, Martin Niemöller. And, uh, but very few. Most of the pastors and theologians of that time went along with Hitler and did just exactly what they said, removed 
how in the world would anybody call himself a Christian and, and let that happen? They did. They had forgotten. They had forsaken God. Again, that vicious cycle that took place. When it comes to today, how about the church of today? I turned 71 years old on Wednesday. So I remember uh, a time when Bible reading and prayer in school started off every day. That was the, the Pledge of Allegiance. I remember one when, when marriage meant one man, one woman. But sometime along in the 60s, things in, in the U.S. used to change. There was a group of people came out with a uh, theory. They said, God is dead, so let us do whatever we want. It talks about in early Israel, right before the kingdom, it said there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own sight. That's kind of a apt description of what happened in the 60s. And... Uh, Things that were considered evil then are considered good today. Uh, I've been hearing on the news constantly about uh, mass shootings everywhere. About uh, every other day you hear of a, another apartment building or something being destroyed by missiles in the Ukraine. And, and people in the United States protesting the Supreme Court decision on Roe versus Wade. I got a okay. I recently heard a, a, a host for a news program. He stated this. He said. And he said, Jesus wasn't against, uh, against abortion because he never mentioned it anywhere in the Bible, in his teaching. Jesus was not against abortion. This man's a Southern Baptist or so, so he says. And he claims that, that, that the Southern Baptist church was essentially pro-life until 1980. I don't know where he came up with that idea. I attended a Southern Baptist church while in college, and they are by no means a... Why then today are people so enamored with the fact that, that, that abortion still should be legal? You know, Roe versus Wade didn't outlaw abortion. It outlawed states from making laws to, to, to outlaw abortion. And that's why when they overturned it, they gave the, the power back to the states. The states have the right to make their own laws. Like it has been since the end of the Civil, Civil War, 14th Amendment said states have rights not specifically alluded to in the Constitution. Roe versus Wade was a bad law to begin with. I got something I don't want to read here. In 1977, Mother Teresa of Calcutta was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her work in, in the India with the children of India and was later canonized by the Catholic Church as a saint. This is her uh, acceptance speech or part of it and I have a tough time getting through this it's uh, kind of very emotional about it and I feel one thing I want to share with you all the greatest destroyer of peace today is the cry of 
is the cry of the innocent unborn child. For if a mother can murder her own child in her womb, what is left for you and for me to kill each other? Even in this scripture it is written, if, even if a mother could forget her child, I will not forget you. I have carved you in the palm of my hand, even if a mother could forget. But today, millions of unborn children are being killed, and we say nothing. In the newspapers, you re read numbers of this one and that one being killed. That's kind of talks about today. This, this being destroyed, but nobody speaks of the millions of little ones who have been conceived to the same life as you and I to the life of God, and we say nothing, we allow it. To me, the nations have been legal, to me, the nations who have legalized abortions, they are the poorest nations. They are afraid of the little one. They are afraid of the unborn child, and the child must die because they don't want to feed one more child, to educate one more child, and the child must die. And here I ask you, in the name of these little ones, for it was the unborn child that recognized the presence of Jesus when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, her cousin. As we read in the gospel, the moment Mary came into the house, the little one in the womb of his mother left with joy, recognized the Prince of Peace. And so today, let us make strong resolution. We're going to save every little child, every unborn child, give them a chance to be born. That was written in 1979. Uh, Roe versus Wade came out in 1972, I believe. Where does it say that, that just because a group of people think something is right, that God must think it is right? God has his laws, his moral standard that he, um, expects us to live by. And the church at times has really fallen down. This group of people there, I'm sure it just, you know, I'm proud of you all. Uh, Free Methodist Church is one of the only churches that it has really stuck to God's moral stand. I've been disillusioned disillusioned that uh, a lot of the churches in this country today. I had a professor in college who was a, a professor of uh, interdisciplinary studies uh, at comparative religion and Flat said that he didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. Why in the world are you preaching and why are you teaching religion? This group of people is the, the, the group that can stop that cycle. If nothing more than praying every day for our, our country. That last point that the writer is making uh, about the vicious cycle. His final word says, his final word is forgiveness and mercy to those who repent. The only way our nation is going to repent is if people like you and I go out and with prayer go out and talk with others about their need to repent and, and receive Christ as their Savior. That repentance, the word repentance, is more than just feel sorry for your sins. That's part of it. But it, the word is metanoia in Greek. It literally means change of mind. And it's not just our change of mind that takes place. Because that change of mind isn't going to take place on our own, own power. The only way that ch change of mind can take place if the Holy Spirit comes into the, the person and does the changing. Well, thank you for listening today. I didn't pass out, so that's good. And again, I want to thank you folks for coming. And may God bless you all. Okay.